Aaron, we're going to get right into this. Um, so everyone's heard of diet pyramids, eat well plates, general uniform advice. What do we get wrong when we create those templates and we promote it to everyone in the population? Yeah, I think the main thing that we get wrong is that we're trying to fit the same diet to everybody. Mm. And uh, our study and other studies basically show that people have very different responses to food. And when you see that data, then it just shows you, just the data shows you that uh, you really have to tailor diets to people in a different way because, because we each are different. We have a different composition, different genetic composition, different bacterial composition. We know that mm. our good bacteria play a major role in our health. Um, and so we're just, we're just different people. And that's why also the food that is best for us should be different. And I think that's the fundamental thing that we get wrong. And I think it's never going to be the case mm. that we'll be able to find a single diet that fits everybody. Yeah. So even the general sort of parameters around healthy eating, do you have an issue with that? Or is it the uh, minutiae of things that we can tweak, maybe the 10% or something like? Yeah. So, so I think it's more than 10%. But obviously, I would agree that there are things that are probably universally uh -huh. uh, not good for us. So... We know that trans fat, for example, is uh, very bad for us. We know that uh, um, uh, we, we did studies actually on uh, non-caloric uh, uh, non sweeteners. And, oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we showed that actually those alter gut bacteria in a way that uh, when you take that gut bacteria and you transfer them to people, they can actually generate symptoms of diabetes in mice. Wow. Yeah. So this we published in... 2014, it made a lot of headlines. Mm. Uh, since then, that study was actually reproduced uh, several different times. And, mm. uh, and and now more and more people are realizing that, for example, those ingredients are also probably bad for us and they're uh, gradually um, being recommended against. When you see those studies from, you know, 2014, the ones that you were involved in, and manufacturers are still using similar sweeteners maybe even sometimes the same sweetness. Does that annoy you? Does it, does it sort of irk you the fact that it's been nearly 10 years and we haven't really moved the needle in the direction of actually helping people? Yeah, of course it annoys me, but, uh, <laughs> but I also re understand uh, that companies that are selling in billions of dollars, and yeah. we can talk about different areas that uh, we also did research in, for example, probiotics. Mm. I think probiotics as a, as a direction, as a concept, could be a good thing, but not the probiotics that companies are selling today, which is a multi-billion dollar industry, but just the probiotics that were chosen were not chosen because of studies done to see the health benefits of these probiotics, but just because um, by happenstance, we found some bacteria that uh, are easy to grow, they don't affect the food too much, they don't change the texture, the smell, right. and, and so on, and, and but they're sold in billions of dollars. So I think in the end, the regulators would have to be involved uh, before um, we, we will see a major change in that. And we are seeing the regulators gradually coming in. It's a very slow process. Mm. Um, I think the analogy is uh, if you look at what happens, uh, what happened with cigarettes, mm. the regulators, they didn't ban it, but they increased taxes so much that, uh, and, and we do see a major decline in uh, cigarette uh, intake. So I think we'll have to see uh, activities of regulators before we see we see a change. Uh, just recently, the World Health Organization actually uh, declared that some of the non-nutritive sweeteners, uh, in part based on our studies, in part based on other follow-up studies that I mentioned, uh, are actually recommended again. So I think these okay. these these uh, things will um, trickle in and eventually have an effect. Yeah, and I guess in the meantime, you know educating people as to what they can do to minimize any particular risk. And I think what regulators and perhaps manufacturers sort of turn a blind eye to is the precautionary principles around food and introducing it before, you know, they've actually tested it uh, and, and actually seen its safety profile. Um, let's dive into one aspect that I think a lot of people know your work for, which is everyone's individual response to sugar. Yeah. Uh, why don't we talk a bit about how there's immense variability in someone's uh, sugar spikes after eating the same products and some of those unlikely products that you think everyone would have a sugar response to, but you actually see sometimes it's it's not as uh, bad as, as we would be led to believe. Yeah, so um, 
Of course, but maybe before that, a few words on even why blood sugar response to food is important. Absolutely. Because I, I think people need to understand that. So uh, when we eat uh, food that contains carbohydrates, our body digests that food and releases it at, as sugar into the bloodstream. From there, our body signals with insulin to our cells that there is now sugar that they can uptake and use as energy. Mm. But if we eat in excess, that excess sugar is eventually converted into fat in our cells. And this is actually the primary mechanism by which we gain weight. Mm. It's not by eating fat, but it's actually by eating more carbohydrates that we're not using as immediate energy, but storing them eventually as fat. So it's really key for uh, weight management. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also key for development of diseases like diabetes, uh, even cancer and, and some other diseases, mm -hmm. because as we burden our system with more and more spikes in blood sugar levels, our body uh, then needs to uh, lose some of the sensitivity to insulin. Mm -hmm. It needs to then secrete more insulin to signal the cells to uptake the same amount of sugar. Mm -hmm. And eventually our beta cells are not able to produce the amount of insulin that's needed. And that's when your uh, beta cells die and you develop full-blown type 2 diabetes. So, so it's really yeah. something key, which is why we decided to study it um, instead of just looking at, for example, change in weight after dietary yeah. recommendations. Yeah. Uh, because because it's important and because if you look at change in weight that's a single measure it takes weeks to affect mm -hmm. and you can't then link it back to every individual meal mm -hmm. the nice thing about blood sugar levels is that you can track it continuously with these devices now with these sensors of continuous glucose monitors mm -hmm. and you can get a quantitative measure a health measure of your response to every individual meal mm -hmm. uh, yeah. so so that was kind of introductory to even what we'll talk about why it's even important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think even on a micro level, so the macro picture of these glucose excursions, particularly if they happen uh, over time in your HbA1c is reflective of that. That can lead to weight gain and, and the other uh, issues around insulin resistance. But even the short-term glucose excursions, do you lean into the, the idea that those excursions outside of what the normal parameters are can lead to inflammation, advanced glycemic end products. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's been shown more and more. Uh, and they can uh, they also affect your blood vessels mm. and your um, your vessel health, which is also super important in the in the long run. So yeah, I think we need to as much as possible avoid these spikes. Now, this is not to say that uh, you know, live your life, of yeah. course, and sometimes enjoy things that even spike your glucose levels. Yeah, yeah. that's fine. But uh, you know, the the less you do that, uh, I think the healthier you will be. And so this is this is one aspect uh, yeah. that we really want to uh, to affect. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because I'm not puritanical about that at all, and I'll definitely eat a donut or like you know we we're just talking about some nice restaurants that exactly. we're uh, <laughs> yeah. going to experience in London. Yeah. So with, with that in mind, we understand sort of the basic picture around sugar control is important. How could, did you um, demonstrate the the immense variability in the glucose responses? To the yeah. Same so things? initially, when we started this, um, um, actually I got into this from personal uh, interest. Just I wanted to. Uh, find a diet that's good for me and mm. reading all the being a scientist and reading all the diets and uh, seeing the recommendations change every month it was clear to me that there's not really solid science behind them uh, so I started experimenting with myself and I saw to my great surprise now now it's less of a surprise but back then that when I ate uh, just um, chocolate or ice cream my blood sugar levels uh, just didn't spike Oh, you were one of the lucky ones. Yeah. All oh, right. Okay. So, so that that greatly that that was a shock. And yeah. after the first day, I remember telling friends that uh, this is uh, this is probably not true. So I'll do it again. I okay. did it again and again and again. Yeah. And then I see the same response. And so, uh, and then somebody else in the lab uh, started experimenting, and he had opposite responses. So then we knew that okay, there is this is a surprise. We have to study this on a large scale. And so what we did was uh, recruit a thousand people. Uh huh and connect them to these devices, the mm -hmm. continuous glucose monitors, the CGMs, uh, and then just have these people log on a diet app that we developed, all their food intake. Mm -hmm. And just to standardize things, we also uh, provided ourselves the breakfast, a very simple breakfast, uh, just either four slices of bread, mm -hmm. four slices of bread with butter, uh, or just pure glucose. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we saw was uh, actually what we saw anecdotally on a few people, we saw on the scale of a thousand people. Basically, you give the same people different. You give different people the same food, mm. and 
It's true for every single food that we ever tested. You'll see very different responses. Wow. Some people will have almost no effect to that food. Uh -huh. They'll eat four slices of bread. You'll see their glucose levels. And if they didn't tell you they ate bread, you wouldn't know it from the CGM. Whereas others would have huge spikes in glucose levels, even more so than, they would, than those same individuals would have if they eat whatever pizza or chocolate or ice cream. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, so this, was, uh, this was shocking. And again, it showed that if we want to affect blood sugar levels, and we just talked about why that's important to do, mm. then we have to tailor these diets individually to people. Mm. Yeah, so just to reiterate for the listener and the viewer, same, same foods, drastically different responses, and we're talking about pure glucose in, in, in some of the- Including pure glucose, including but it. also you know, complex carbohydrates, sometimes foods that are considered to be good that would be recommended by a dietitian. So if, gotcha. you, if you go to a dietitian and they recommend for you a Mediterranean diet, mm. and some of the meals that will include rice, maybe they'll tell you, okay, eat brown rice as your carbohydrate. Mm. We see that that brown rice spikes blood sugar levels for people, some people, much more than uh, junk food. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So if you look at that parameter, again, I'm not saying that then the junk food would be good. It yeah. may be bad yeah. for other things. Yeah, but yeah. But at that, but from the perspective of that parameter, and if you think you're eating healthy and you eat that day over day over day, you're basically that brown rice actually may be driving you to developing diabetes faster mm. than if you didn't follow the recommendations of the dietitian. So putting this into context, because the, you know people have come across uh, glycemic indices for different foods it's very well um taught by dietitians well-meaning nutritionists as well in general practices across the country across the world how do we generate those and clearly if what you're saying is true those are deeply deeply flawed yeah so so first how do we generate them so typically uh we do studies on uh, a small number of individuals mm -hmm. 10 or 12 uh, or 20 people uh sometimes a bit more we give them the same food. We measure their blood sugar response exactly as we did in our study. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we take the average. Mm -hmm. So when you do that, of course, you will get a result. Mm. And it will be true that some foods will have a higher glycemic index than others. What that means is that the average of those 20 people that you measured mm. is going to be higher than the average for even those same 20 people when measured on a different food. But, and this is the key point, if you look at the average, of course, the average of zero and 20 is 10. Mm. The average in 10 and, and 10 is 10. But in the first case, you have huge variability between yeah. the individuals. In the second, you have identical responses. And so what we're seeing is that in every single case, the glycemic index, mm. when you look at the individual numbers, they'll be very variable. Mm. So what does that mean for you as an individual if you don't know if you're uh, one of those that contributed the low number or the high number to the average, of course, you don't know if that particular food is good or bad for you. Yeah. So that's why, yes, you can measure the glycemic index. It's also true. This is the average of the food. But because of the very high variability, which is greater than the differences in the averages, it's very hard to put together a diet that would be good for every individual based on the glycemic index. Do you think given everything that you've been studying for this amount of time, we should completely disregard these indices? Or is there any place for them in dietary guidelines? Yeah. So, you know, I would say in the absence of any information, of course, uh, if I was given the choice between two different foods, one mm. with a high, one with, with a low glycemic index, I should probably eat the low glycemic index food. Statistically, just your average person gotcha. would have a lower response. So it's like what we talked about before. I, I do believe that there are general principles mm -hmm. that uh, we can follow and that would be uh, better than uh, not following them and they would be good dietary advice. Mm. But I think they achieve only a, a very small fraction mm. of the full benefit that we can get if we fully personalize uh, diets for people. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example for... Um, of course, when we talk about uh, all these blood sugar responses to food, the major factor that even we find in, in our studies is that the amount of carbohydrates you have in a meal is the single most determining factor for the response. And 
Okay. And and that's obvious. Yes, yeah. of course. Even though we see variability across people, of mm -hmm. course, on average, the more sugar, the more carbohydrates you eat, mm -hmm. the higher the blood sugar response will be. But if you quantify that, then we see that the amount of carbohydrates in the meal explains about 15%, 1-5% of the variability in blood sugar response compared to the algorithm-based diet that we developed, which can explain 50, 5, 0 wow. percent of the response. So we get more than triple the effect of what we can explain in people's response mm. when we uh, uh, just follow, um, when, we, when we take the full algorithm diet compared to only taking the amount of carbohydrates. And, and this, by the way, is also um, very critical because if you look at a disease of diabetes, but type 1 diabetes, where um, the patients really don't have yeah. beta cells and, and they really need to inject insulin in order to lower their blood sugar responses, the standard of care right now is to um, tailor the amount of insulin to inject according to the amount of carbohydrates that you ate in the meal. And we know that that's off. That'll explain only 15% yeah. of the variability. And, and, and what happens, and you see this in type 1 patients, is that sometimes they'll inject too much insulin, which actually yeah. could be very detrimental, eventually even leading to death. Mm. And sometimes they won't inject enough and their blood sugar levels won't go down. And, and that's bad for other reasons because high blood sugar levels eventually yeah. are very bad for your health. Yeah, I, I mean, just leaning into my clinical practice, um, I, I remember vividly having some patients that really struggled to get on top of their blood sugars despite being pretty rigorous about their foods and ensuring that they were of the correct GI index and they understood the dosing of insulin. And so that alone can explain a lot of the variability that these poor patients were experiencing. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And hypos are nothing to be scoffed at. A lot of people exactly. won't realize that, you know, hypos can be extremely detrimental and the yeah. reason why a lot of them uh, are admitted to A&E. Yeah. Um, is there, a, putting that aside, which I think is a very important aspect of medicine and uh, to understand the variability within uh, people's responses, is there a danger of being a little bit too myopic about it, the glucose responses per se, i.e., you know, if I game my diet to ensure that I have a nice flat glucose curve, am I inadvertently going to be putting myself at risk by having too much saturated fat and increasing my risk of cardiovascular disease that can only be demonstrated over a longer period of time when I have a heart attack at 20 years because yeah. I've been eating fat the whole time? Yeah, so, so that's a good question. Um, so, and I'll answer that in two different ways. I'll say first, in terms of uh, pushing you more towards eating fat, uh, we actually haven't seen that um, have a detrimental effect. In fact, in the studies that we conducted, we conducted randomized clinical trials on our diets, mm. uh, which uh, do push people towards, on average, eating more fat. Of course, it varies between people. We've actually seen measures of fat go down. Triglycerides, cholesterol, they actually go down. Mm. And the reason is because in a healthy person, even if you eat more cholesterol in the food, your body is able to clear that away and it doesn't elevate cholesterol levels uh, in the blood. So I think for some of the aspects, um, at least we haven't seen any aspect, any, bi any biomarker mm -hmm. that we could measure that on our diets, which really target blood sugar responses to be flat, uh, we haven't seen any detrimental effect. However, having said that, I will say that, of course, uh, the goal can never be only to lower mm. blood sugar levels, mm. because if you want to do that, then you, you should fast, mm. right? If you fast, <laughs> yes, that will uh, lower your blood sugar levels, but after a month yeah. or so, you'll die. Okay, yeah, so, yeah. Um, of course, that cannot be the only goal, and we want our nutrition to be nutritious. We want to uh, be intaking a variety of different food, diversity of foods, eventually uh, all the minerals, all the vitamins that we need. So... So we have to have a diet that um, uh, tailors to all of those aspects. Again, we went after the blood glucose response, uh, well, because it's clinically important, but also because it was the only thing, I think it's still the only thing, that we can really measure continuously and really take a unbiased, data-driven mm. approach to that. I'd love for us to be able to measure inflammatory markers on a mm. continuous basis, mm. um, fat uh, lipids, uh, and so on in the blood, uh, but uh, we just don't have the technology to be able to measure that. Yeah. On the day that we will, 
we'll be able to do exactly the, take exactly the same approach that we did for glucose to looking at uh, many other uh, aspects. And until we do that, I think we just have to diversify our foods while maintaining low blood sugar levels. Yeah. On the, on the subject of biomarkers, I really want to get to the Human Phenotope Project. Tell us about what that is and why you're doing it. Because compared to what we've just been talking about now, the stuff on glucose is like a drop in the ocean compared to the ambition of this particular project. Yeah. So um, we started with this nutrition project for the reasons I mentioned. When we finished it, we said, well, uh, we, took, we looked back and we said we were able as a lab to recruit a thousand people, get them to wear the continuous glucose monitors and really develop a product. So, or, or develop an approach that we mm. showed uh, has uh, beneficial effects. And then, then uh, we said, well, if we did that for nutrition and we looked at the microbiome, let's take a much broader vision. Let's look more holistically mm. on human health and let's measure everything that we can about people. And the inspiration was uh, the Human Genome Project where uh, we had the, the view of the genome and if we look at the 23 years that have passed since we first sequenced the human genome, that project taught us a lot. Mm. Uh, basically, now we know um, hundreds of genetic variants that are involved in every single disease, and, and we reduced the cost of drug devel development by about 50%. But then when we looked back at that, we said, that that's amazing, transformative, but it's only the human genome. Mm. It doesn't take into account any of the environmental factors nothing about what we eat, how we exercise, and where we live, and, and so on and so forth. And so uh, we drew basically on the ability uh, of, to execute these projects like we did and the Human Genome Project to come up with now the Human Phenotype Project, which really aims to eventually measure everything about people in as many time points as possible and track them longitudinally. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to do that, um, we've that's what we've been doing for the past five years. We set up a clinic at uh, my lab. Uh, people come in every day, dozens of people, and they undergo a very, very extensive set of tests, clinical physiological tests that uh, measure their cardiovascular health, mm. that with imaging, we take high resolution image of their retina, for example, where you can see the intricate uh, blood vessels, uh, density, curvature, uh, numbers, and so on. And, and that's really a window to the heart. You can. Uh, with advanced AI tools really tell a lot yeah. about a person just by looking at that. Mm. Uh, we use DEXA to do a full body scan uh, and look at bone density, mm. uh, ultrasound to look at fat in the liver and the carotids. Uh, we use sensors like the CGM but also sleep sensors to assess your sleep quality uh, for three different uh, uh, nights. Oh, they literally come in and they have a sleep study? So they do that from the mm. comfort of their home actually, oh, wow, but okay. uh, which is much more convenient. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we have... Uh, these are sensors at the grade of a sleeping lab, except you don't wow. go to a lab, you do it from home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, we talk about nutrition, but of course we know that sleep, sleep quality, is really a, a major driver of, of health. That really hasn't been uh, studied. It's never been measured with these sensors mm. like we're doing now on uh, thousands of people. So uh, having all the other information that we have, like the diet of people and so on, uh, and their lifestyle, I believe, and these are the algorithms we're trying to develop now, that will also be able to uh, help and tailor your your sleep and basically uh, be able to uh, give you lifestyle behaviors that would improve your sleep quality. And, and again, sleep is just one yeah. of the aspects that, yeah. that we're measuring. Absolutely. And then I think the other uh, exciting aspect of the study is that we're looking at biomarkers, like you mentioned. So. Uh, we're looking really at the molecular level mm -hmm. and together with all of this physiological and clinical information that I mentioned, we are also measuring uh, the genetics, but then also microbiome, gut and vaginal microbiome. We're doing metabolomics, which is uh, a study of thousands of different molecules in the blood. We quantify uh, which ones are there and at what levels. Uh, we all know cholesterol, that's one of them, but we have thousands of, mm. of them. Many of these molecules, we don't even know what they are but we can link them then to diseases. And once we find a molecule that has a strong link, we, link, we can go back and identify what that molecule mm. is. Uh, we look at proteins in the blood. We look at RNA in the blood. Uh, we ourselves developed a proprietary assay for the immune system. So uh, in one go, in one experiment, we can tell you all of the viruses you've ever been infected ever with. Ever been exposed to? Yes, at wow. least those to which you currently have antibodies for. Wow. 
So COVID is, of course, one example. Yeah. We can do that easily. Yeah. But uh, in that same experiment, we can identify um, your exposure to thousands of different viruses. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and and this, this really has meaning. So uh, actually, one of the we never published this, but uh, one of the correlations we found was between uh, Epstein uh, virus infection, which many people are yeah. affected by, and uh, a disease called multiple sclerosis. Yeah. So this link between EBV and MS, we, we found it. We didn't publish it because you know it was just an association. Yeah. And then we saw last year there was a beautiful study uh, published by um, the a data based on the U.S. military, where they tracked soldiers for 25 years, and they saw that EBV infection actually um, was um, predisposing people for development of, of MS. Wow. So a lot of these associations can yeah. really have uh, meaning. And, and again, this is just uh, one virus one, and yeah. one disease. Mm. We have it for all the viruses and we can measure all of the different uh, yeah. disease outcomes. Because EBV, my aspect of that, because a lot of functional medicine practitioners will specifically ask about a history mm. of EBV infection. Um, and there is certainly loads of association, whether it's caused or not, who knows, yeah. but certainly there does appear to be a pattern that warrants further investigation. If you can get this bank of information, this, the, these biomarkers, then we can begin to tease out who's going to be more at risk of previous EBV infection and autoimmune conditions like MS. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, so that's really the vision to, to be able to profile people very ex comprehensively, and I believe that this human phenotype project that we developed is is the most uh, deeply phenotyped cohort that currently exists. And the vision is to track a very large number of such individuals. We profiled 12,000 so far, but our next milestone is to hit 100,000 and do it not just in Israel, but also in additional countries. Mm. And, and I think this is the type of data that will allow us to move from reactive medicine to preventative medicine, where we'll be able to identify biomarkers that basically tell you where you are on the trajectory to developing disease or to staying healthy, and, and be able to uh, initially just tell you that trajectory, and then at the second stage also be able to intervene and move you back to, uh, give you advice that will move you back to the trajectory of staying healthy. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of what gets measured gets managed. I think that's a, a common term that everyone's coming around to the idea of. And I think our current suite of tools, particularly in preventative cardiology, are limited in that, you know, there's still arguments raging around LDL cholesterol, OPB containing lipoproteins, yeah. all these different, different um, uh, biomarkers that we have. But what I thought was quite interesting about your project is that you're trying to look for novel biomarkers that we wouldn't have even thought of and yeah. no one has even discovered yet. Talk to us a bit about how you're doing that within the field of acute myocardial infarctions and, and, and preventative cardiology. Yeah, um, exactly. So, um, so I think if you take any marker like LDL cholesterol, which people are arguing about, uh, I think it again goes back to personalization. That, mm -hmm. That's my hypothesis. That if you were able to overlay on top of that other biomarkers, maybe you'll find a stratification of the population mm -hmm in which for some individuals, high LDL cholesterol, maybe they go with some other biomarkers that are either protective or uh, that, um, that mitigate uh, the effect of the high LDL cholesterol levels in, in those individuals, but do not in other individuals where those biomarkers are, are, are absent. And, and, and that stratification will, uh, will allow you to get a more, more a precise picture. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think it's uh, it's not just measuring additional biomarkers, but it's really also doing the analysis to finding uh, combinations. Mm. Uh, so I'll give you an example of one study that we did. This was on acute coronary syndrome patients, basically uh, people who present with a heart attack at the uh, at the clinic. And uh, what we found was uh, that we could actually take a personalized medicine approach to that. And what I mean is uh, take even a single patient. Um, if you look at standard practice in general, uh, you know, your standard patient goes in, does some blood tests. As a general doctor, you look at the blood tests and you look at normal ranges for different um, of these blood tests and, yeah. and you can say what's normal and what's abnormal. But that is, uh, again, very general. Uh, of course, it should vary by, uh, by age, yeah. by gender. By... Yeah. So what we do here is we take a single patient 
we go back to our very large healthy cohort from the Human Phenotype Project, and then we identify a personalized matched cohort for that single patient. Mm. For example, a 60-year-old male who underwent a heart attack, we'd go to our healthy cohort, find 60-year-old males who did not undergo a heart attack, right. and then for every different marker, we would build the right reference panel. For many of these, there's, there are no reference panels because we are the first to do these measurements, yeah. like all these different metabolites. So we build the right reference panel, and that's a reference panel uh, or no, a reference range of values that is personalized for that patient. Mm. And then we can see where that patient uh, falls, and we know that we're looking at the right reference group for that patient. Yeah. So when we do that, for example, for the thousands of different metabolites, then for each patient, we can identify those metabolites, those blood tests that are abnormal for that patient yeah. when compared to his correct personalized yeah. reference matched group. Mm. And then we can look at all of those deviations and we can ask, are these deviations metabolites that are affected by diet or by genetics or microbiome or lifestyle factors and so on? And by that, identify the pathophysiology of disease for that patient and also what should be targeted for that patient. Because if I have a patient where I can see that the metabolites that are disrupted or metabolites that I know are generated by good bacteria, then it's not gonna to help to um, uh, tailor the diet for that individual. It's gonna to help to go and do a, a maybe a, a targeted probiotic intervention, some intervention in the gut bacteria and, and vice versa. Yeah. And we know today that on average, by a rule of thumb, every medication that you give is only effective in about 20% of the patients that you give it to them. 20%? Uh, I mean, this is just a, you know, a ballpark number. Yeah. Of course, it yeah. varies by, by different drugs and indications, but yeah, on average. Yeah. And uh, you know, all the amazing developments in cancer immunotherapy, for example, um, we have some cancers like lung cancer, which was incurable several years ago, and you'd know you, you'd die within a few years. Now, 20% of patients who receive cancer immunotherapy for lung cancer, they fully recover from it. But then the other 80%, for many of them, it uh, goes back within a few years. And for some, it goes back um, even faster. And, and eventually, it's not uh, yeah. it's ineffective. Mm. Um, and there, for example, people have been studying also the gut bacteria. And they've been finding that, for example, sometimes there are bacteria in the tumor itself which are breaking down the immunotherapy and rendering it uh, ineffective. And so the thought, and a lot of uh, even pharma companies and researchers are now working in these directions, is that if you give the cancer immunotherapy together with a treatment and a targeting for those bacteria, you may be able to render the cancer immunotherapy to be effective. Fascinating. So again, this is just one example where uh, we understand some of the mechanism perhaps, but. But again, as a rule of thumb, yeah. um, medications that are uh, generally effective on average, again, statistically, like we talked about the glycemic index, yeah. um, you want to be one of the lucky ones for which the medication works. But uh, for many, it doesn't work. And I think the reason is because the underlying root of the disease varies between people. This is what we're seeing with acute coronary syndrome patients. Mm. And this is likely going to be true for most diseases just to zoom into that acs patient the acute coronary syndrome patient a bit more i think you articulated this really well in your lecture about how the disease risks are going to be different depending on the the patient that you're seeing in some cases you know more of a genetic risk factor is coming into play in other cases they can have a great diet um, but actually it's you know the environment in which they they live in or stress or whatever it might be so you're going to be able to give us, hopefully, a clearer picture as to which determinant, which risk factor is having more of, a, of, an, uh, of an impact on someone's ultimate uh, disease. Exactly, yeah. So again, I think by the idea of profiling individuals and then comparing them to um, really what is, what is the right reference panel specific for them will allow us to highlight for people, and not just for acute coronary syndrome mm. patients, but for everybody, to highlight uh, where they are in terms of um, overall health mm. and which body system uh, perhaps is affected. This relates to other studies that we're doing on just aging of different uh, body systems. And, um, 
and yeah, and so and so by that we can identify uh, where you have abnormalities and what should be targeted in different people. And we know that uh, if if your diet is fine, then you know targeting that is not going to help you. Mm, mm, that's super fascinating. And in terms of the uh, use of probiotics, uh, something that we get asked about a lot. There's lots of probiotics on on sale online with various studies supporting their efficacy. If I'm taking anything away from what you're saying, it really depends on the patient cohort that's going to respond positively or negatively to the probiotic that you're introducing beyond just the strains that you're introducing into the digestive tract as well. I'm assuming you've done a number of different studies looking at various strains in using your cohort. Yeah. Um, exactly. So we've done uh, studies on some of the available probiotics today, and I'll tell you what we found. Uh, we found that, uh, first of all, uh, colonization mm. uh, really varies between people. So we took uh, you know, one probiotic product, which has 11 different bacterial strains. Mm -hmm. We saw that in many people, there was no colonization. So just the probiotics, they go in and then they go out and the go same out. way. That's, exactly. Okay. And in others, there was colonization of just uh, a, a small number and it varied really between people. Uh -huh. uh, and so to the extent that part of the effect should be mediated by colonization of the gut bacteria for many people, and this is again, probably in a personalized manner mm. for many people, it's just not going to have an effect. Okay. So that's, so that's one discovery we had. Uh, the second was actually, I think very interesting. Uh, you know, um, doctors prescribe probiotics, uh, you know when, uh, yes. after you give antibiotics yes. for whatever reason you gave them, you, you typically would, uh, this is general practice, you tell people, okay, now you should take probiotics in order to restore mm. your uh, gut bacteria. Mm. So what we found is that if you give probiotics after antibiotics, then in contrast to the lack of colonization we saw before, after antibiotics, we see much more extensive colonization because mm. the antibiotics basically clear the niche allowing for probiotics to now thrive but then what we discovered is that that colonization of the probiotics actually delays significantly restoration of your original microbiome mm. so if you had a healthy and good microbiome and you know now you got infected by some bacteria you had to use antibiotics and of course you should use antibiotics um, then taking probiotics after that would delay significantly by even months restoration of your original microbiome. So this general advice that we're giving uh, people, um, you know, is has many uh, has many issues that uh, we weren't aware before of yeah. before the studies that uh, that we did. This was uh, actually part of an episode of 60 Minutes in the US. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. we, we went uh, on, the, on that show to uh, talk about these. Wow, discoveries. that's yeah. brilliant. We'll link to that in the show notes for sure. So that's a case of where the probiotics are doing a great job of colonizing, but the net effect is actually something that you probably, don't want. Probably <laughs> negative, exactly. So yeah. we didn't study the long-term uh, clinical impact of okay. not restoring your original microbiome, mm. but uh, I'm just saying this is an observation that uh, yes, it may have exactly. bad clinical effects, we just don't know. Mm. And so just blindly taking antibiotics or prescribing them mm. after uh, antibiotics mm. may actually have a negative impact. Those who are taking probiotics where it's just going in and going out, it's probably not doing any harm except um, you know, it's wallet. costing you money. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Is there ever a situation where you've seen some, uh, some of the cohort introduce probiotics and it have a great colonization effect are, are they like hyper uh, responders to mm. probiotics that you you've seen so i think the studies that we have done so far have been on uh, too few people okay. to be able to to say that but uh, again i just want to emphasize that i think the concept of probiotics is actually a good concept because mm. uh, because our studies also show that some of the bacteria that we have uh, just are some of our commensal bacteria are probably not good for us. Some of them are giving, for some people, a propensity for obesity or for developing diabetes. And sometimes we're missing some protective bacteria. For example, in the acute coronary syndrome patient study, we actually identified bacteria that we think are protective mm. that are absent from ACS patients. And so a follow-up study that we want to do is now to actually give these specific bacteria 
to uh, high-risk individuals, individuals who for many different factors are at risk for cardiovascular disease and lack this bacteria that we identified. Wow. That's a probiotic, if you will, that we want to give them. But but you see, it's, it's a... It's a data-driven one mm. where we first analyzed a very large uh, cohort, identified which bacteria in a data-driven manner yeah. are either missing or shouldn't be there that we'd like to either introduce or replace. Mm. And then we go in surgically with the right bacteria uh, in order to uh, give them and see uh, the, the benefits. So, so I think this is the future. This is what we should be doing mm. uh, in terms of the probiotics and not just the ones that we're giving today. Yeah, it's almost like you're giving drugs uh, in a targeted manner, but in this case, it's it, probiotics. Exactly. Do, do you remember the strain of those particular uh, bacteria that you might be looking to introduce into someone's Yeah, we, we, there's there's a few of those and I can, oh, okay. I'll send you a link to them. Okay, this cool, was published yeah. in Nature Medicine. Because the years one ago. that everyone always remembers is the one that introduces weight loss, Akamansia. Yes, yes. <laughs> and everyone, and that's on. Which, by the way, uh, I'll say that now that we have our studies on 12,000 people, yeah. by far the largest microbiome cohort, we're actually finding that Akamansia is not really ah, one that... Interesting, yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah. And we're finding many others that, that are... We actually, we actually found that Akkermansia is actually providing support for other bacteria that do have oh, some benefits. Wow. So by itself, according to our data, if you partition people between those who have Akkermansia and those who do not, we don't see a difference in uh, wow. weight. But for many other bacteria, which are the ones we want to give as probiotics, we do see. Mm. And for some of them, they're correlated with uh, Akkermansia. So, we actually think it's a secondary finding and not really the, the root cause. And I think this shows you uh, yeah. what we study and learn from small numbers versus what we tease out and identify robustly when we go to uh, larger numbers. Yeah, it's almost like the deeper you go, the more complex it is. And yeah. you realize actually it's collections of different strains rather than singular strains. Uh, are, are, are just are working yeah. alone as yeah. sole actors. And it's also the power of numbers. Uh -huh. So um, something that we published uh, was, uh, you know, there, there's, if you look at microbiome studies, uh, which are typically done on still on dozens, sometimes a few hundreds of people, th those are small studies. So if you look at many of them, they'll be uh, contradictory. So some bacteria, you know, like Akkermansia would be found in obesity in one paper, but mm. not found in another paper. Mm. So, so how do you reconcile all of these um, contradictory findings? So what we found is that if you take our very large cohort and you sample dozens or hundreds of people and you ask, okay, which bacteria are relevant for obesity, you'll find one answer. You sample a different set of individuals, you'll find a different answer. You'll sample a different set, you'll find a different answer. Yeah. So just by chance, you'll sample a small number and you'll find some association, but those will not be robust and you won't find them on uh, you know, 10,000 people. Yeah. So yeah. it's only when you start to go to larger numbers that you do the sampling again and again and again and you get the same answer. Uh -huh. yeah. So you really need, uh, you know, if, you, if you're doing statistics, you need to do them with uh, large numbers and, and hence the Human Phenotype Project, which, which really aims to go to uh, hundreds of thousands of individuals. Yeah, I was going to ask that, uh, like, in terms of the next milestone, it sounds like it's 100,000. In reality, if we're really going to get pre pre precise about genomics and, and uh, uh, dietary advice that's truly personalized, introducing other biomarkers and metabolomics, etc., all the omics, how many people do you fathom you'd hmm. need to have in order to get to that level? So I think the more that uh, we'll get, we'll be able to get more and more accurate results. Uh -huh. um, I think with, with the 12,000 that we already have, we already have been able to make a lot of discoveries. I think we'll be able to make another major leap with 100,000. And then once we go to, hopefully we get there, and then uh, may, I'm not sure if it'll be me, but maybe somebody else will uh, take the next leap to, to a million. I think we'll be able to make uh, more advances, but then um, they'll be for conditions that are probably more and more rare. So not to say that it's not important, mm. but um, I think the most of the common factors, common morbidities that, mm. that we're seeing, I think a lot of them will be able to uh, study and identify with 100,000. Fascinating. 
Let's talk about fecal transplants, because you, you mentioned this uh, in your lecture as well, and I've, I've seen you mention it in previous talks. Yeah. Uh, and it, there is a bit of ick factor, I think. People come around to this idea. But uh, what I thought was interesting is actually you're using the donor's own matter. So what kind of things have, we, have you gleaned from the, the studies you've done thus far, and in which particular areas are you concentrating? So we've done this uh, for atopic dermatitis, a disease of the skin. A uh, very prevalent disease very in about prevalent, yeah. 20% of children, 10% of adults to various mm -hmm. degrees. Uh, we did initially a proof of principle study just mm -hmm. on nine patients, but all of them responded amazingly and positively with reductions of clinical manifestation of disease within uh, two weeks of providing them with bacteria, with, with fecal material from a healthy donor. Mm -hmm. um, we're now doing a, a larger study. Um, that's what we've been studying. Of course, uh, FMTs are uh, f um, for a infection in, in the hospitals for Clostridium yeah. difficile infection. Um, they're really now, uh, they have amazing efficacy yeah. and, and they, they're, they're being used. Um, but I think eventually this is not the approach that we'd like to take uh, because um, it, it's very hard. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's less reproducible. Mm. The material that you'll be giving will vary even within the same person. And yeah. of course, across uh, different individuals uh, and it's also a very crude uh, intervention and so uh, really the uh, the the where we're going is to try and do it much more surgical so to identify the specific bacteria that are the ones providing the therapeutic benefit mm. extracting them growing them in a GMP facility uh, and then providing them as a data driven probiotics right. if you will uh, to patients and, and seeing if that can be beneficial. And I believe that by choosing the right bacteria, we can have an impact on virtually every uh, human condition. There, there's even FMT studies, not that we did, that others did on autism. Mm. Showing that, so you know, in autism, there's also an association with various uh, GI yeah. tract uh, issues. And uh, it's been shown even in uh, children to increase uh, their overall function for autistic uh, children. Again, still small-scale studies, mm. but just showing what I think is the potential. Mm. Uh, and But eventually, I think also there, FMT would not be the way to go, but we really should try and understand and identify the mechanism, the specific bacteria that will put together as hopefully a therapy, also for autism, but also for uh, many different other conditions. Yeah, because I was going to ask about that proof of concept study with the atopic uh, dermatitis. How did you select the healthy donors? And how did you convince yourselves that, okay, this healthy donor with an absence of atopic dermatitis is going to be beneficial even of itself for the person afflicted with the condition? Yeah. So, so we didn't know. Uh, okay. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we, just, we just tried. And, okay, uh, yeah. Um, and, and we basically took uh, young, healthy donors who are overall following what we think is a healthy diet and gotcha. you know, living a, a healthy lifestyle. Uh, but we didn't know. And actually, in the follow-up study that we're doing now on a larger population, we have a donor where um, we didn't see big, uh, big effects. Mm. We switched uh, to a different donor, and now we are seeing uh, big beneficial effects. So, so. There's no doubt that the donor is uh, is going to matter. Mm. Uh, the studies that were done so far are still at too small of a scale, both our studies and in general FMT studies, because because they're also hard to execute. Uh, so, uh, but I think so. So here too, the power of numbers. We talked about that before. I think that'll also be needed before we tease out and identify the specific bacteria that uh, that we need to provide. Uh, on that note, around being more surgical about probiotics, uh, everyone seems to focus on the bacteria that you find in the in the digestive tract. But down there, it's not just bacteria, right? You have nematodes, fungi, viruses. Yeah. How can we determine that it's not a collection of other microbes that might have a supportive role for the bacteria that aren't also enabling that effect that you see? That That's a great question, actually. And, uh, and we don't know that. And until we actually go in with the specific bacteria and compare it to the FMT, mm. we won't know the answer. And, and you're right, it, but it, it's also not just the other viruses and fungi. It's also when you take a fecal matter, it contains uh, other proteins mm. and uh, other um, elements that are and metabolites that are secreted mm. by these uh, 
uh, different uh, living creatures that, that we have. Uh, so it may be part of uh, the effect of those. So, uh, so actually, that, I think that's a great scientific question, which we are and everybody is aware of, mm. and we won't know until we actually go in surgically with uh, some bacteria. Um, so again, the approach that we're taking is we're using, because it's not realistic to um, do an FMT from hundreds of people to tens of thousands of recipients, mm. we're taking um, you know, a data-driven approach by analyzing our population of 12,000 people to identify there from the very large-scale data which bacteria are relevant for which indication. And then hopefully by finding those robust findings and going with those bacteria in, those will actually uh, incre that'll increase the chance that these bacteria uh, will have an effect. Gotcha. So I think that's our best shot yeah. on goal for that. Yeah, no, I agree. I think taking that data-driven approach using the tools and the knowledge that we have today is, is almost like the next point of um, uh, uh, the proof of concept um, step to take when it comes to these studies. And uh, I, I guess like if we sort of fast forward five, maybe 10 years in the future, and you have these collection of metabolites from uh, all these different cohorts, and we have a lot more robust understanding about these associations and how much diet, genomics, and all the other risk factors play. How do you see the future of, of medicine? You know, uh, do people need to see a, a, a doctor or need to see their surgeon? Can we, can we really envisage a world where everything is essentially individualized and personalized from your diet, your exercise routine, your supplement routine, your herbal medicine routine, if that's uh, included in that, in that small border of, of treatments? W what is your sort of vision in that respect? Yeah, so actually I think we'll, we'll never, and we don't want to take doctors out of the equation. I think we want to just empower doctors with uh, much more sophisticated tools that uh, really provide them with more information so that they're not in the dark so that they don't just prescribe probiotics after antibiotics without knowing yeah. what effect that will have, right? Yeah. Like we talked about before. So I think it's really about empowering uh, doctors on the one hand, but also empowering patients and just, just people mm. with the ability to have tools to track their health on a continuous basis. Again, not, uh, you know, not uh, obsessively, not uh, all the time and mm. of course enjoy life and so on. But yeah. Uh, but I think um, I think we can move a lot of the testing that we're now doing on occasion in the clinic and many people are not compliant with. We can move that uh, to the comfort of our home mm. uh, using technologies, using the uh, smartphones that we all carry, using uh, smart watches, using other uh, sensors. Yeah. Um, and then when there are issues, we would go to uh, we would then go to an educated person to we would go to a doctor. But that doctor would also understand what we have been measuring, would know how that all links up with previous findings and would be able to give us better advice empowered by all these data and discoveries that have yeah. been made. Yeah. You've got a fancy lab with lots of all the tools that everyone could want, you know, as a computational biologist. If there were a selection of biomarkers that people should get regularly tested of all ages, and you've only got five, a maximum of five. Um, which ones do you think we should be leaning into more? I can almost guess the first one, but I'm going to let you. <laughs> I'll, right. let, I'll let you. And you're limited in terms of the, the complexity. It needs to be those kind of biomarkers that somebody could get readily available, either sent to them or, or uh, generated by their doctor. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, you know, I, I think we can't exclude, uh, you know, 100 years of, of medicine which really identified uh, a lot of the biomarkers that are really key. So yeah. yes, I think if we are to track five biomarkers, yeah, I would track the, the ones related to, I would choose one related to, to glucose yeah. uh, management, of course. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, hemoglobin A1C or fasting glucose or using uh, CGM, mm -hmm. then some that are related to, uh, to lipids yep. in our blood. Um, yeah, so, so a lot of the standard ones, if we just had five, and, and I think we, identified those that give the greatest uh, value for money. But again, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Mm. And I think once we identify now many different um, biomarkers that are relevant, then we'll be able to also 
personalize them and, and for different individuals it'll be different markers that we want to follow because yes hemoglobin a1c is very key because we want to control our glucose but for many people like those lucky people who almost eat everything and never spike yeah. their blood sugar levels you know for them it's it's not a relevant biomarker yeah yeah yeah, right? yeah so for them it'll be something else so again we're going back to statistics if you had to choose five for all the population you'd probably choose the ones that we have been following but uh, if you were able to tailor them for people, I think you would uh, make individualized choices on even which biomarkers to follow yeah. for which people. Because some people, from their profile, you'd know are more prone to diabetes. Some people are more, more prone to developing neurodegenerative mm. diseases. And some people are more prone to developing cardiovascular-related diseases. Yeah. And the biomarkers are different for each. Yeah, absolutely. Are you, have you made any changes yourself since doing this over the last how many years? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> what, yeah. what are the key things that well, you've changed? So this whole thing actually, my, my whole getting into this uh, actually started from personal interest in uh, running. In running, yeah, okay. So I'm an amateur marathon runner. I, I had a dream to uh, break the three hours in a marathon. Okay. Uh, and I, you know, continuously improved my uh, running skills, but then I realized that diet is important. Yeah. Um, but back then I was eating, just following the den general dietary advice, you know, you do carbohydrate loading the night before you go for a long run. After you, you, uh, you do the long run, I was very hungry, so I also ate also carbohydrates to restore yeah. Yeah. Uh, all of those that I depleted during the run. And then realizing uh, by measurements that a lot of these carbohydrates were spiking my blood sugar levels, I just stopped eating them before runs and okay. I stopped doing carbohydrate loading and now I could go for a 30 kilometer run and eat just a regular whatever salad and egg or whatever really? meal the night oh, wow. before. Yeah, yeah. Not eat anything before I go on a run and surprisingly actually not even feel hungry, uh, feel very energized during the run and not even feel hungry hours after I complete the run. This, wow. this is for me. Yeah, yeah. What do you think you're tapping into? Do you go into ketosis or do you, you tap into fat stores? So I don't think I personally am, am in ketosis because I don't uh, um, uh, almost completely avoid carbohydrates. Uh -huh. But I think I tap into, for sure, a much more uh, a fat utilization mm. for mm. energy uh, during exercise. Uh, which I think, at least for me, has probably a lot of uh, benefits. Mm. Um, and I think the other thing, this is this is not uh, not scientific, but more yeah. of a hypothesis. You know, I think uh, the reason why you may have a difference between feeling hungry or not, if you think about your carbohydrates storage, an average person would have about 3,000 calories that you can store in glycogen mm -hmm. uh, for carbohydrates, even yep. if you do a carbohydrate loading. Mm -hmm. 3,000 calories is, is about the amount that you need for a marathon or mm. if you go on a 30 kilometer run for the average person yeah you'll deplete most of that so if you think about your the sensors that you have in a body you take a system that's uh, after you carbohydrate load that's at 100 percent you drive it down to nearly zero after a run your body senses that yeah and signals your brain that you're now low on carbohydrates you should upload and uh, uptake more carbohydrates Right, you have these sensors mm. uh, which trigger hunger. And I think that if you tap into fat for uh, energy, you know, an average person stores about 60,000 calories of fat in your body. This is why we can fast for, for many, many weeks mm. and, uh, and still survive. Uh, and so if you go even for a long run and you go down from 60,000 to 57,000, um, you know, you've only depleted three or 5% of yeah. that, and maybe then your sensors, uh, you know, are not signaling that mm. uh, you're, you're hungry. This is just a hypothesis. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But there is a very intriguing difference. Uh, for me, it was very surprising that um, going on long runs without any carb loading um, and then not feeling hungry, yeah. I, I, could, I could go almost a full day after and not eat. Um, it yeah. was very surprising. Well, this this is what's interesting about your work because I think it's going to explain those differences that people anecdotally have. The fact that some people can fast uh, in the morning and train on that and do their some of their best yeah. gym work or their PB runs versus other people who are like, well, I can't 
I can't uh, uh, run without having a proper carbohydrate load. Exactly. And you know they need to you know have all that, that uh, their their food and, and stuff before that. So it is really interesting to to see that. Yeah. Um, one of the other things I was going to ask about was, uh, and I've, I've literally just lost my um, train of thought now, uh, supplements, that's it. In terms of all the information that you've gleaned from your own uh, information, your own biomarkers, have you, have you changed your supplement routine or do, are you bullish on supplements or is that something that... Um, actually, I, I, right now I'm not taking any supplements. I was vegetarian for a while and I took mm. uh, B12. Mm. Now... I went back to eating meat and stopped uh, mm. taking B12. Um, yeah, in general, um, I believe that if you're eating the proper diet and you're eating diverse enough diet, then and you're healthy, of course, you're mm. not lacking uh, uh, something in particular, then you should track yourself. But uh, in most cases, I think you'll be able to maintain balanced, healthy levels of uh, all of the different uh, factors without uh, taking in supplements. I think... I think that should be the goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To basically get things naturally. Yeah, yeah. That should be the goal. And I think because we're we're using tools that essentially give us the reference ranges for the average, if my vitamin D3 level, for example, is low, uh, I'm inclined to push that a little bit higher because of what I know about vitamin D3. Yeah. Putting aside the fact that I don't have clinical symptoms of vitamin D deficiency. I just want to make sure that I'm doing the right thing and I'm topping myself right. appropriately. But you know, outside of that, I think a lot of people are finding themselves in the same conundrum to supplement or not to supplement. So, I mean, I are on the side of, okay, I'll supplement a little bit, but I get your point. I think yeah. the goal is to not have to supplement That's the goal, possible. I think, yeah. yeah. And you know, it's all, there's also a difference between if you supplement whatever, vitamin B12, mm. And your levels of vitamin B12 in the blood now became normal. Mm. It still doesn't mean that you know. Then there's absorption. And, yeah. Uh, is your cell? Are your cells really able to utilize the yeah. vitamin B12 and and so on? So so even taking the supplement and even seeing that it has an effect is is not telling you the full story. So you know I think in the end, um, you you know when okay when when you eat when you eat an apple. Yes, you are also eating some glucose. It may spike your blood sugar levels a bit, uh, maybe, maybe not. But you're also getting all of the other nutrients that are in the apple, many of which, by the way, we also don't even know yet. What yeah, they are. yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, they were conducive for that apple to grow. So uh, I think by that analogy, eating whole foods, eating uh, less processed mm. foods that every processing that we do to the food, it alters it. Yeah. takes away some uh, ingredients that were uh, relevant for its growth and maybe introduces some other ingredients during the process that are not good. So, you know, I think eating naturally health, um, whole foods that are right for you, I, I think that would be what we should strive for. That's what I strive for. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're a shining example of that. Um, uh, you mentioned that you're looking for collaborators across the world. We actually had Professor Kuna on the podcast, um, who does the South Asian uh, mm -hmm. biobank study um, as a complement to the UK biobank because South Asians are underrepresented. We have lots of risks of type 2 diabetes and, and the like. Um, what kind of collaborators are you looking for and in which geographical uh, regions? Yeah, so uh, we are looking to expand the Human Phenotype Project, as I mentioned. Mm. Uh, we're really looking for expanding and not just by the number of people, but also culturally, ethnically, genetically. Um, so yeah, any population, I think the UK has a diverse yeah. population, much like we have in Israel, but different type of diversity. Mm. So uh, here would be a great place to open up a site yeah. and open up a clinic that would uh, do all this very extensive profiling. Mm. And I think we'll learn different things. And when we'll combine it with the other data sets that we'll ha we have, we'll be able to also arrive at much more robust findings that are not just specific to uh, to the Israeli population that we've been studying yeah. so far. So if anybody's hearing this and is interested, uh, we basically have a platform where we can very efficiently at relatively very low cost um, speed up uh, profiling of individuals with everything that we have been doing or even a subset of that. Um, 
And uh, so people who are interested in following up such courts, um, I'd invite them to, uh, to talk to me. Yeah, epic. Well, you're doing incredible work and I'd love to support in any way possible, but appreciate your time, man. You're awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you. If you enjoyed that video, you'll love the library of content that we have on doctorskitchen.com. Make sure you hit subscribe and we have podcasts in our library on brain health, well-being, supplements, and lots more. Have a wonderful day.